All right, we're going to talk about prescribed burn associations and how landowners can effectively and safely apply fire to their land. And again, it goes back to the old situation of neighbors helping neighbors. It, it's the way things used to be where neighbors got out and helped each other work and do things. Again, used to help each other burn. And that's the way we want things to be and to continue to be and work in that. And that's what a kind of a prescribed burn association can do. So if you look at it you, and you talk to people and you see there's, there's four reasons why most people don't burn. And the number one reason is liability. You, you could go all over the, across the U.S. talking to people, and they'll come up and say liability is number one fear that they have about fire. That fire is going to get away. I'm going to burn up the whole county. going to cause problems. going to get into a lawsuit. We're going to do all that. Well, part of that is founded on fear itself. And again, we can't find a lot of proof of that, that that's going on. But that's still a reason that people use when they're not wanting to put fire on the ground is that fear of liability. Also, people typically just don't have that knowledge or experience. They just don't have the, the learning about fire, that, that experience with fire. And so again, you know, we're scared of the unknown. And so we don't, you know, work with things that we just don't really understand or know about. And then also it goes back to we don't have as much people to help, you know, labor is short. And we also don't have enough equipment to safely to conduct that burn. So how do we overcome these obstacles? That's the biggest question. Just how do we get more fire on the ground? And how do we overcome these obstacles and get things done? Well, the first thing that we can do on the liability part of it is, is insurance. A lot of people say, well, if I had insurance, I would burn. Okay. Most landowners do already have insurance. They just don't realize it in the form of their farm and ranch liability policy. So again, check with your agent, check your policy to see what extent, what coverage is there. But most farm and ranch liability policies do cover that. You can also attend workshops and field days and different things to, to try to get some experience, to learn more about fire. You can hire people to do that. But again, the people you hire, do they know anything about fire that you're doing? And then you can also buy equipment. You know, the question about buying equipment, though, is it gets expensive whenever I, I you know, I've only got X number of acres that I'm going to burn, but I've got to spend this money for this equipment. That makes it pretty expensive. So, you know, we can overcome this, but that does that solve our problem? And most of the time, it doesn't. It just, it adds a little more questions to that problem. So, to really answer that question is, prescribed burn associations. And what is, first off, you know, what is a prescribed burn association? A prescribed burn association is a collective group of landowners that live in a community that pool their resources, pool their experiences, they pool their equipment, they pool their labor, and they help each other burn. And by doing all this, that also can help to reduce the risk. So again, we have our insurance to help manage that liability, but the biggest thing that we're doing to manage that risk and that fear of that fire is we're helping each other burn. We're neighbors helping neighbors. We're in, if that fire gets over on my neighbors, hopefully, you know, he's right there helping me burn and he understands that that fire could possibly get there. But also at the same time, we're going to say, I'm going to talk to my neighbor and say, hey, I'm going to burn. How about you burning? And then we can burn from road to road. Don't worry about property boundaries and then make that fire a whole lot safer when we don't have to deal with property boundaries and fires getting over on neighbors. Because again, they're wanting to help each other do that. Also again, you know, we learn by doing. So again, now we're starting to attend burns, we're gaining experience, we're learning more and more about doing that. And again, the labor, it's neighbor helping neighbor, you know, the way things should be. And then finally, on equipment, we start pooling all of our equipment together, you know, again, People have four wheelers, people have UTVs, people have sprayers that they use to spray herbicide or spray livestock with. These can double up and be used to, for spraying water, for suppression needs, things, whatever. We have tractors, we have equipment, we have discs or whatever we need to do to make fire breaks that we can share or help, you know, we know where we can hire somebody now to help us with a fire break and get it done and get all that. So we pool all that equipment and we help each other burn. And that is what the prescribed burn associations do and how they answer those four questions or problems that arise that people see or have. 
So the next thing is, well, how do I get one started in my community? Well, again, the main thing is we've got to assemble that group of interested citizens, and those typically are the landowners, the people that are wanting to burn, that seeing that fire, they're doing that. They're the landowners, the lessees, and stuff like that. Then also we need to get that collective pool of people that are part of state or federal agencies that work in our area, you know, whether they be for, for wildlife, um, county extension, local fire departments, people that may be key players in, in the realm of fire. Also, some of these people may have some fire experience, so you can help bring that in to help get some more experience about fire and, and do that. Next thing we need to do is pick a leader. Somebody's got to step forward to take care of that. And typically, you want that leader of the Burn Association to be a part of that landowner community. You know, it's, it's a grassroots community-led community deal. The agencies, extension folks like that, those folks are there to provide technical experience and to give advice and to help out with things like that. But we want it to be led by the local folks. Then we need to set some goals and an area where we're going to work at. You know, we need to pick, are we going to work within this county? Are we going to work within a multi-county area? You know, what's this area that we're going to do? And then the next thing is we got to go out and accomplish a task. We need to go out, plan a burn, conduct a burn, and get things done. And that's the most important part. On doing that. There's also some guidelines that we that we have used on numerous prescribed burn associations that we've helped form and set up. Typically we want to have some type of governance over this so that we can have control over people that are burning, over who's using the equipment, you know, making sure that those burns are conducted properly and safely and under the guidelines that the burn association is set. Most of the burn associations typically have some type of officers, typically simple president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. If you have multiple counties or areas involved and you want maybe to go with a board of director type governance, that's fine. You know, you may pick two from each county or two from each area, so you'll have equal representation over that area. You want to set some kind of dues structure for collecting money, collecting dues, because again, a lot of times what these dues go to is to help maintain equipment that the Burn Association has, also helps to pay for training or helps to pay for, for a meal get together that people may have at some kind of annual training or whatever they have. Most of the Burn Associations have about $25 a year dues. There are some Burn Associations that do $25 a year, and then the year that they burn on your property, you pay a dollar an acre for however many acres were burned just to help go into it. Again, this money is just used to help maintain equipment that the Burn Association has. Again, set some kind of fire training, get together meeting, typically before the main burn season starts, so everybody can get together, get started thinking about burning, get started making sure plans are there, fire breaks are ready, getting, you know, everybody get an idea of how many burns we're thinking about doing this year and getting things going. Next thing, make sure all, all burns have to have a written fire plan. Again, it's up to that landowner to get to either write that fire plan or to get somebody to help him write that fire plan. Again, that could be from an agency or from another landowner that has experience with that can help them do that. Again, the liability still rests upon the landowner. You're not transferring liability anywhere at all, but the landowner still receives the benefit of the action, so it's still their fire. Uh, some burn associations actually make them show proof of their insurance, their liability insurance on that. Also, again, all burns should have adequate and proper fire breaks that are needed for depending upon the burn type and whatever minimum that the guidelines that the burn association may have. Also, a minimum number of personnel that needs to be on the burn to make sure that's a, a burn association sanctioned burn. So that way you don't get somebody who just says, oh, I'm part of the burn association. I'm going to go out and burn today and they're all by themselves. You know, have a minimum set. You know, we're, we're going to burn this with four people or we're only going to burn with six people. We have to have a minimum. Also, you know, may want to keep an equipment list on hand of what, what equipment the Burn Association has, what equipment other people could bring to help do that. And then also you may need to keep track of burn participation just to make sure that people are helping with burns. Again, when they want their property burned, they just don't show up and, and disappear. We've never really had that problem with any of the burn associations I've worked with, but you know, people have thought about that that could be a problem, but most of the time it's not. Most people want to help. They want their place burned, but they also want to help with other people and get things done within that. 
Goals and objectives of a burn association are fourfold. Uh, and again, we've used this for all the burn associations that we've worked with. Is again, that you've got a group of people, they're out there to share equipment, they're out there to share labor, they're wanting to train their membership to get everybody more effective in safely using fire. And then the main part is they're fostering good relations between the neighbors, you know, with fire and also within that community because a lot of times too you know we're trying to reintroduce fire back into an area where fire culture has been lost and so a lot of times you may have some some thoughts or some you know some different ideas about fire within that community but again we start using it safely we start using it effectively we, we start educating that community they see the benefits of these fires and so it's a win-win for everybody not only the local landowners but the people within that community in regards to the use of fire on what they can do. Also by grouping together as a group and as a burn association and getting that formalization of, of an association that you're that you're working with, you, you find out that you can also become eligible for grants and stuff that are out there that a lot of different agencies and stuff may have. Whereas an individual that's wanting to burn and stuff, you know, he can find maybe find cost share, but there's no ability to, to help me train with the burn and the equipment and doing things like that. They're going to cost share with that burn. But whereas if we get together as a group, there may be funding out there through groups like National Wild Turkey Federation, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Fish and Wildlife Partners Program, Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever, even Conservation Districts. We've got, we, I know burn associations that have got grants from all these different organizations and many different other ones. And again, what this does is help them to buy and to fund good equipment so that the, the, did you have good working equipment that's reliable, making that burn safely. Uh, again, vehicles, radios, all different kinds of things. And there, so there's all these different things out there that as a group that we can work together and get, whereas in, as an individual trying to do it, that stuff is not available and is not there. Also, another thing that may be a benefit in some areas, again, every all areas are different within that, is working with the rural or volunteer fire departments, so your local fire departments in there. Because again, what that can do is, is, is help the burn association as well as help the local fire department. Because again, what it does when you're burning could possibly bring additional manpower, additional equipment to those burns. There may be opportunity to rent equipment or to, for low cost, have a fire department bring a truck out, have some people set just, you know, in case something does happen, you've got somebody right there ready to go. But also, if as you look at it with the, with the fire department standpoint, it's also a training opportunity where those firemen can come out watch and observe fire, understand fire behavior. Because again, most of the time, most fires that they're on, they're out there chasing fire. They don't have time to sit and learn. You know, they're out there just spraying water on stuff and not watching fire behavior and understanding how fire behaves and what it does. And so that's a big, big plus with it. Again, I've worked with burn associations where we've had fire departments that work very well with the burn association. Actually, I know it's three burn associations were fire chiefs are the actual presidents of the burn association because they're also landowners and they also understand the need for fire and doing that. But we also at the same point, I have burn associations that have fire departments in their areas that do not like the thought of people burning and doing that. And, and again, they're, you know, they're hands off with everything that they do about it. So you can have the whole spectrum of it. A lot of it is again, educating each other, working together, and showing each other that you can work together and make things better for the, for the entire community in what you're doing. The main thing that we need to remember that another thing that the Burn Association does is it provides strength in numbers. It, it allows for a group of like-minded people getting together to promote fire, working with fire, and then you can actually change policy, change policies on what agencies may do or may help out with what's going on. Also, there's a possibility to, to dictate and change law into what things are going on. In Oklahoma, we had a county commissioner burn ban that was enacted. And again, we were able to change the laws through the burn associations working that way with, with legislators and stuff and to get it where they were exempt and could burn while the burn bans were in effect. And also, again, it gives you that political and economic benefit as well through the grants and through being able to influence 
what things that, that can be done. But probably the biggest thing that it gives you is that risk management. It allows you to manage the risk of that fire by pulling everybody in that neighborhood together and starting to apply fire and apply it safely. Again, one of the burn associations in Texas that I've worked with, again, they, one year they had this member they were going to burn and his neighbor was very against the fire, but again, you know, it couldn't stop the fire and, you know, was, was claiming all this that, you know, you don't let that fire get on my property and do that. Well, after they conducted the fire a year later, the neighbors saw the benefit of the fire, what it had done for the land, how things were. And by that time, the next year, that guy was a member of that burn association. So again, it gives you that strength in numbers and helping people out and seeing that and different things you can you can do. But then probably one of the biggest things it does is we start training future generations in the safe use of fire. We start getting younger folks out there, getting them involved with fire, helping out, seeing that fire is important, learning how to manage fire, learning how to do fire, and that makes a big difference in the future of what fire and how fire will be handled in that area. And so that's a big part of it is being able to do that. Uh, currently in Oklahoma, we have 23 uh, PBAs that cover 36 counties of the 77 counties here in Oklahoma with over 350 members of these burn associations. These burn associations range in size with you know, membership of 10 to 12 to I know burn associations, we've got some that have over 60 members that come to meetings and stuff on that. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, th those burn associations reported conducting 309 burns on 77,000 acres uh, throughout that state. They've all received grants for equipment and training, you know, in some shape or form, they have all have really good equipment and doing that. And it's been a big benefit and it's been a big boost to the things that are going on and getting fire on the ground and getting it there safely and effectively. And that's the most important part of it. Again, there's also there are burn associations in Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, Mississippi, Colorado, Illinois, Missouri, North Carolina, uh, Florida, South Dakota, and California all have burn associations. Now there are over 70 that are active throughout the U.S. currently, and they're continuing to grow, and they're continuing to catch on because, again, people are seeing the importance of this community-based application of fire and getting it the need of fire back onto the landscape and also the benefit that that brings not only to each individual landowner that uses that fire, but also to the community and wildfire preparedness, fuel reduction, Again, the wildlife interests that may be going on, pollinators are going on, livestock production, all the benefits that go within that become very big and important. And as you look at how effective are these and you know how, how they have done, in 2012, we did a survey of, there were, at that time, there was about 50 burn associations in the Great Plains. We surveyed them and had 27 of them responding back from Nebraska, Kansas, Texas, and Oklahoma. And at that time, they had conducted almost 1,100 burns throughout that area and uh, were doing it very effectively. And that, that 1,100 burns were conducted on 472,000 acres during that time frame. Again, getting a lot of fire on the ground. But then people start asking, well, what about the safety? What about the liability? You know, what's going on with the fire? And that's, that's the most important part to find out. And then from that survey and then from all that information, what we found out, uh, we got information about spot fires and escaped fires. To explain what we're calling a spot fire is a fire that left the burn unit, no matter what the cause, but is able to be extinguished by the equipment and people that were on site when that fire occurred. And of those 1,100 burns that were conducted, there were 224 spot fires recorded, so that was like a 21%. So our one in five fires that were conducted, there was some type of spot, but they're able to put it out. We didn't have information on size or anything like that, but then also we asked about escaped fires. Escaped fires were defined as fires that left the burn unit, no matter what the cause, but the, the people had to call for outside assistance to put that fire out. And there were 16 or 1.5% of all the fires that were conducted during that time frame of the 1100, only 16 of them initiated in escapes. But also from that survey, we asked the question, how many lawsuits, how many insurance claims were you involved with with all these fires? And the, and the answer was zero. No lawsuits, 
no insurance claims. So again, that's a big part of it. We have to remember, spot fires and escape fires are things that are going to happen. It is just like us driving automobiles. We can be as safe as we can, but there's always a probability that we will have an automobile accident. You know, we can do our best to keep it from happening, but it will happen. And so the same thing with fire. We do our best and we can keep it from happening. And again, and keeping it down. If you look at activity just from Oklahoma here recently, just in, from 2015 to 2018, these were 19 of our PBAs that reported conducting 309 burns during that time frame, 77, over 77,000 acres. Again, there were no lawsuits and only one minor insurance claim was reported out of all these burns. And that, that, that one insurance claim was to repair a telephone junction box that was missed whenever they were preparing for the burn. It was hidden in a bunch of tall grass. It caught, it got hot, melted a bunch of wiring, and they had to pay phone company to come out and repair the phone box. And that was the only insurance claim out of all those burns that were conducted. So if you look at that same number of burns, the safety record is again very, very good. Looking at of those 309 burns, there were 45 spot fires occurred. That was a 15% of all the burns that were conducted. But what's really interesting, if you look at it, over 88% of those burns were less than one acre in size. Those spot fires were less than one acre. So again, where are those big fires that people are always scared about getting away and getting out? And if you'll see, only three fires occurred that were less than 100 acres inside. No spot fires occurred that were greater than 100 or greater than 1,000. Also, the other important thing is that volatile fuels, typically the volatile fuels here are eastern red cedar, juniper species that were present on over 90% of the fires, again, and they're burning with that. So that's, you know, they're being able to conduct, safely conduct burns, even with volatile fuels present. If you look at the escape fire occurrence, there was 11 out of those 309 burns, 4%. Again, you look at it, 36% of those escapes were less than an acre in size. 54% of them uh, were 10 to 100 acres in size. Again, there was only one reported that was over 100 acres in size. Also, at this same time, again, remember, no lawsuits and only one insurance claim, and that was from some fire that was from not even from an escape fire it was just from burning up a utility box on during and burn so again these burns and again these landowners are conducting burns they're doing it safely they're doing it effectively and getting that getting that mission accomplished so if you want to look at it and see what pbas can and have accomplished again they are effectively and safely getting fire on the ground on private lands. Again, we've seen that through our number of acres and number of fires that have been conducted by all these burn associations. They're also having positive impacts on the land. Again, reducing woody species, uh, improving habitat for different wildlife species, as well as improving habitat for livestock grazing and things that the, the, the landowners are important to their livelihood and things that they're doing. But also, again, helping with the community, providing good community education and getting people comfortable with the use of fire, working with local fire departments, you know, reducing fuels, reducing the effects of wildfire and things that we can do it. Also, these burn associations have provided avenues for grants to fund for equipment and for training for its members and being able to get that stuff that's going. And again, from the burn records that we've been able to keep and to show is that they, these landowners are safely applying fire to the land with a very reduced spot fire, even escape fire rate. Even the number of acres that would happen to, to burn outside that are very limited and very small and do that. And so again, these burn associations have a huge impact at the local level, but also at a state level and at a regional level. And they're very important to get going and get maintained and, and again, they have, been, they have shown and been proven that they're an effective avenue for landowners to safely and effectively apply fire to their land.